Hey guys, Anthony Medico, SVG Storm Ventures Group. I'm here with Steve Badger. Hey. hey. <laughs> Down at, how, how do you say your, your firm's name? Zell. Zell. Yep. Is it a partner, partnership? Zell or? LLP. Okay, we're downtown Dallas. Came in, I was shooting uh, courses this week in Dallas with some of the contracts on the field. I actually got a couple hundred guys coming in today. That's great. Uh, but Steve, uh, you know, big kudos. Steve came in to win the storm last year. Did a little fun debate on stage with myself, John Hutelang, about all the crazy chaos in the industry. <laughs> and uh, so I was in town. Steve heard I was in town. Wanted to invite, uh, invite me to his office. I was a little nervous about coming in because of the security. <laughs> yeah. and I said, hey, turn the cameras off. I don't want to get any subpoenas. <laughs> no, I made sure everybody was nice. I kept everyone away today. Uh, and I was nervous about contractors coming, but this worked out great with you and I. Yeah, I'm I, did glad have, you're here. I did have about eight, nine guys that wanted to come with me. I, oh, I said, I don't think Steve would appreciate that. But uh, three topics, guys, we want to talk about. Uh, we got, you know, 45 minutes or whatnot is contractor licensing in Texas, pros and cons. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's a part of the market that I'd say a, more, a majority of the market here, of the guys at least I know, would like to have licensing in Texas. Absolutely. And there's a small portion that are uh, not interested in that. Um, and then we want to hit on deductibles. That's always a, a fun subject in, in Texas. And if we got some time, we can revisit the UPPA laws. Oh, and joy. The constitutional <laughs> stuff. Yes, everybody's favorite topic these days. So a little bit, uh, Steve, for some of the guys watch this right now, most of the guys know who you are, especially in Texas. Okay. But, you know, we're in a fairly... Uh, Fairly large uh, floor plan here. You got, how many attorneys do you have on staff here? I have 24 attorneys in Dallas. Uh, we've got about 80 lawyers nationwide in about eight different offices. 24 in Dallas. Of those 24 lawyers we have in Dallas, 22 work almost full time on nothing but hail and hurricane claims. Hail and hurricane yeah. in the state of Texas. Yep, that's it. Yeah. So this is the Full Employment Act, uh, what's going on right now for my firm. Um, not that I want it to be. I'd rather fix all these problems and right. all of us get along, have my clients pay claims, everybody be happy, and I could go retire and do something else. <laughs> um, but that's not the uh, situation we have, so I'm happy to employ a bunch of lawyers doing this work. Now, when you say uh, 24 attorneys, that's in the state of Texas. So you got yeah. 24 guys. There. So you're, you're covering Corpus Christi, all the way, you know, the new hurricane area. We are. Yeah. So, you know, when contractors, when these storms hit, and now for guys watching this don't know you, you're an attorney that works for the carriers, just the guys who know you. You don't, yeah. you don't work for contractors or necessarily Mrs. Smith. You're typically hired by the carriers, correct? I am, yeah. Don't call me if you want to sue an insurance company, <laughs> all right, because then uh, I'll ask you a lot of interesting questions. Uh, there might be a conflict of interest. There might be there. So, uh, no, we, uh, we do get those calls by accident sometimes, and we quickly refer them to reputable lawyers that we know in the state that we like and, and do a good job. And, uh, but I do get a lot of calls from Mrs. Smiths, mm -hmm. uh, and the Mrs. Smiths who call me Google contractor fraud Texas, and my name pops up because of articles I've written, lawsuits I've filed, and that plays into your first issue of contractor licensing. Mm -hmm. I get a phone call, Anthony, almost every single day, and I'm not exaggerating, from somebody who's been ripped off by a bad contractor. Mm -hmm. yeah. And because of that, I've become passionate that we need to regulate this industry. Now in that's Texas. interesting because I get about 30 calls a day from contractors <laughs> who feel like they've been ripped off by carriers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and you know what? And I get 30 calls a day from carriers, you know, who are hiring me uh, in the contractor right. disputes. But there's little other area uh, with homeowners who have problems right. with contractors. It's kind of a niche it's a legit. area. Legit. You know, every industry has its, fraud, its, its fraudulent issues, I think. You bet. You yeah. bet. And we, you know, it's, it, it's an issue that I'd like to address. And the problem these homeowners have is they have nowhere to turn because the lawyers don't want, the plaintiff's lawyers don't want a $10,000 roof dispute against a, a contractor because mm -hmm. they can't make any money. They can call the local district attorney who's typically not going to prosecute a little case. They can call the Better Business Bureau who will just give them a check, you know, against their rating. So it's a concern. So we need, that's the symptom of the problem. We need to treat the problem, and that is to address the few bad actors. Mm -hmm. I emphasize the few bad actors in the industry that is rooting it for everybody. Now, do you ever get a call from Mrs. Smith that feels her insurance company maybe hasn't funded the job properly or slow You pay? bet I do. And I, when I do? get those calls, I refer them to a reputable plaintiff's lawyer that we know who sues insurance companies. Okay. So yeah. I think that stuff goes, I think that's probably on both sides of the... That's a, that's a both side of the table Absolutely. issue. Obviously, it's been in a situation. Yeah. Um, one of the things we want to talk about, Steve, is, oh, real quick, I just wanted to ask you. So 
You know, when these storms hit contractors, we talk about scale up. Contractors have to scale up. They have to hire 10, 15, 20 salespeople, production managers, QC inspectors. I'm just curious on your firms, do you guys actually have to scale up, you know, hurricane hits? Do you have to go out and hire like 20 new attorneys to fill in the gaps or how do you? How's yeah, it? it's a great question. We, uh, we try not to go to a mass model of, of trying to represent the whole industry. We've primarily been a commercial firm. We represent commercial insurance companies. But because of our work, we're getting more residential clients, and that's where the volume is. Mm -hmm. So we've tried to stay away from the huge volume, but we've always been about a 15 to 20 lawyer firm, and because of hail and hurricane, <clears> we're now at 24. I could hire 10 more lawyers and fill their plates full time if I wanted to do that work. Uh, I could call a few insurance companies uh, that we know and that we work with some. I say, uh, I can take more work from you if you want, but I don't want to do that. Uh, we've got a nice niche practice right now where we represent our clients in disputed claims. And then I have my niche practice, and that is fighting all the fraud and bad conduct that crosses my desk every day. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we could gear up, but we don't that who's much. Your, uh, just out of curiosity, who's your top three carrier clients, or is that is that confidential? Well, we work with a lot of the large commercial carriers, pretty much the entire I'm assuming the ones we see market. on a TV commercial every day. Uh, <laughs> you see TV commercials, you hear about them in different cities in Europe. Right. Um, we represent most of the commercial market, and then some of the smaller residential carriers. We don't represent the big, big residential carriers. Those are not our clients. We represent small regional Texas residential insurers. So before we get into contractor license, I'm just curious, because when I grew up, I wanted to be an attorney, yeah. and I ended up doing other things, but what compelled you to enter into this niche? This is a very particular niche. Insurance restoration is a niche amongst mm -hmm. attorneys anyways. Now you've chosen the niche to go on the carrier side, which guys watching us right now probably don't love. <laughs> and there's other attorneys like John Hutelang and, and you know the John Blacks and, and uh, you know, different ones that decided to focus on a property. Or what compelled you to jump into the niche on the carrier side? Yeah, so when I was a young lawyer at this firm, I got hired in this firm to do subrogation work. Subrogation is when an insurance company pays a claim, they have a right to sue the responsible party. So when I was which could a, be another carrier. Uh, yeah, typically yeah. it's a, well, the work that I did, and that's how I got into this niche, I was a young lawyer right when Hurricane Andrew hit. So my client insured lots of commercial buildings down in Miami, and I flew down there to look at subrogation for Hurricane Andrew losses. So I learned all about roofs. Now, that, was, the, now that was massive issues down there. I mean, fraud, there was, all kinds of stuff. All kinds was, of issues and poor construction by contractors, poor design, poor products. So we uh, sued a bunch of uh, companies for buildings that came apart in Hurricane Andrew that shouldn't have in lower speed air, lower wind speed areas. I recovered about $40 million for that claim. Now, did the property owner hire you or did the insurance No, the carrier? insurance company. Carrier, the carrier, yeah, the carrier you. pays the claim, then they have a right to sue the responsible So they wanted to go after somebody and say, hey, we've got a you know, million dollar claim here. We want to hold someone else responsible. Right. And they hire me. So I was a plaintiff's lawyer. I'm just like a plaintiff's lawyer in those cases. I'm working on a contingency fee, uh, but I'm doing it for insurance company clients. So I did that, learned all about roofs. I mean, I had a roofing expertise. For the next 10 years, pretty much all I did was roofing-related plaintiff's work for insurance companies. You know, so you, started in, you basically started in Florida. Yeah, I did. You well, I was living here. I, I flew down there to handle those matters. And then I worked, finished that. I flew around the country handling large hail losses and wind uh, blow-offs and collapses. And then I moved to New York, handled 9-11 handled, uh, litigation. Really? Uh, yeah, I represented the insurance companies that insured the World Trade Center in a lawsuit against the airlines uh, for their negligent security uh, in allowing so they're that could they, So they're hiring you to save money. They're hiring, no, they paid the money. Right. So once they pay the claim, they have a right to get it back. Right. So uh, I did that. I settled that case against American and United Airlines for $1.2 billion, and, uh, and I was going to retire. Um, and I came back. I was done. Well, hold on a minute. What's the spread on that? I can't talk. What's about the big? It was. Uh, it turned out well for my. I, mean, firm. I, I hear numbers like thirty percent. Is that I, okay? Um, it turned out well for my firm. I might have to get any other. You know, yeah. kind of change industries. Here. Well, but then I was done. I was going to quit. And here's what happened. Then I started getting calls from insurance companies saying, "Badger, we've got all these new hail claims coming in. We've, we're seeing hail lawsuits like we've never seen before. Will you please help us?" Uh, you're I mean, the when you say hell lawsuits, you're saying where property owners are filing lawsuits? No, uh, yeah, well, property owners are suing the insurance companies for uh, disputed hail claims. Right, got it. And they said, you know a lot about roofing. Will you help us with these? And so, this is now back in Texas. This is back in okay. Texas, 2012, 2013. I saw something was changing. I could see that there By the way, that's about when we launched SVG. 
Well, that's you're a smart guy. <laughs> I'm just you're kidding. an entrepreneur. I'm joking. That's your height. <laughs> and uh, so you saw it, and others saw it, and we saw this dramatic uptick in the number of disputed hail claims. So I saw it. I got involved. I brought you a present, by the way. I hope you'll wear it one day. It's got our logo on the front, Zell T-shirt, wow. and on the back. It has our coveted. I think I'd lose credibility. What the hail uh, I think, I think logo? I, th yeah. I appreciate it. All right, you can wear it just lose, the bed where no one sees you. I might lose a little here, credibility right? with the guys, but <laughs> so, so we coined that phrase, and I got very vocal because I'm a vocal guy about issues, and we got very involved with it, and now I'm the hail guy. Yeah. yeah. Now I did a little research study on you know the number of public adjusters across America, the number of licensed contracts, the number of policyholder attorneys that help the property owner. I never really did any stats on your side. Is there a lot of companies like I mean, I, I don't hear of a lot of companies this size that do what you do, or is there, is there a, do you have a lot of competitors? Sure, yeah, there's lots of law firms in Texas who defend insurance companies and disputed claims. I think we've- Probably started, more here than anywhere else in the country, I'm assuming. Well, you know where the pot yeah. beds are. Yeah. Here, Florida, Colorado, right? Those are the hot hail beds uh, or hurricane locations. Uh, so lots of firms doing this, but we've carved out a niche in the commercial area mostly. We represent most of the commercial carriers, not all of them. Because you want the bigger claims, right? Well, that's just what we've always yeah, done. Yeah, I mean, that's natural. Yeah, it's just what we've done. You know, if you look at the stats, there's, uh, you know, what I the little bit of research I did before the last event, there was, you know, I could find less than 5,000 firms, and there's not a lot of research to find them, that actually do what you do, but on the policyholder side. There's not, yeah. and, there, and a lot of them are one manner, they're, they're smaller outfits. There's not a lot of firms. There's also less than 20,000 licensed public adjusters nationwide. And so on the policyholder side of, of your equation, on the other side, there's not a lot of advocacy on a, on a property owner side, just from the research I did, which leads us down a road. We'll get into this later in a whole, yeah. well, contractors are somewhat, somewhat often compelled mm -hmm. to act in the advocacy of the property, which is something, you know, a lot of statutes don't want to have happen, but there really isn't anybody there oftentimes when there's that disagreement, but we can get into that later. One of the first things we want to talk about, guys, is contractor licensing. We got a, we we got, a question. Coming. Oh, we got a question out there? Already? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's later on. It's the uh, biggest question from Matt Barron's. Um, isn't, the, isn't the unintended consequence of UPPA laws hurting Mrs. Smith? when there aren't enough PAs to help millions of these small Absolutely. We'll, yeah, we'll hit on that, Matt. Tell me, we'll hit on that when we get to that. We will, let's hit on contractor licensing first. That's a hot topic. I'm not from Texas, but I have a lot of clients here that I'd say 70, 80 percent of them would like to see licensing pass in Texas because that leads into probably better, better codes, better profit margins, better pricing overall. The, I think the pricing would move up. What's your take on it? What do you see happening? Uh, give an update from guys from your angle and, and why, are you, why are you involved in it? Or wish to be involved in it. Yeah, so for the past several sessions, contractor licensing has been presented to the Texas legislature. Uh, uh, Roofing Contractors Association of Texas, North Texas Roofing Contractors, they went to the legislature the past several sessions and they advocated for contractor licensing. You know, we regulate lots of trades and different or industries. Well, if you cut hair and put makeup on in Texas, you got to be, you got to get, you got to get continuing ahead and get a license. Yeah, but you don't have to put on But a if I put a million dollar roof on a skyscraper, I can go ahead and knock it out. I don't need a license. Right. So we're on the same page with the contract. Well, uh, it's a little odd, you know, when you look at it from my, my point of view. I come from licensed states. You know, all the states I ever chose to be in, Minnesota, Illinois, Florida, always the heavily licensed states because I like the higher price and profit margins. Yeah, well, in Texas, there's, uh, there's two groups that oppose uh, licensing. Number one uh, are the Tea Party Republicans who don't like regulation. Right, and that's one of the reasons it dies every session early, uh, because there's no support there. But why, but why the roofing trade by itself when you have people that cut hair that need licensing? Why would the roofing trade, which is a, litigi uh, you know, a lot of litigation, a lot of liability, why the one trade that you know, probably should be licensed, why, why would that one be honed out amongst others? I've, uh, I've because it's new. It's new regulation. Okay. They're trying to eliminate regulation. Had contractors been licensed 20 years ago, had someone done it then, it would still be going on. So it wasn't there before. Okay. So any, any new licensing... So it's more of a general like, phenomenon. Hey, I don't like the word new regulation. Period. Right. Okay. So that's, that's one uh, group. Then there's another group of contractors who are these small contractors, and they view licensing as a barrier to entry into the market. Uh, they think any type of licensing will be intended to protect the big guys. Well, some of the guys watching this right now would like that barrier to entry. <laughs> yeah, they would. And I, and I believe it's necessary to some degree not to exclude the small contractor, but to exclude the crook contractor. And there are some of those. Well, don't you also want an educated contractor? Absolutely. I mean, would you want an attorney that's not gone through some form of education? You have to have some type of education. No. And that's what our cat's doing a great job. Well, sometimes a little barrier to entry is good. It's not uh, a bad oh, thing. Yeah, absolutely. You know? 
you know, you take a test, it's not hard. Yeah, I took tests in Minnesota. I don't come from a construction background, but I passed, you know, Florida, the Illinois, ta the Illinois State Test, the Minnesota General Contract. You know, you get in Florida, you got to get the books, <laughs> and you got to learn how to look up the codes. It's a game, you know, you take the pre-exam. But that's, I, I, think that's a necess I think that's necessary before you start ripping off, you know, million-dollar roofing projects. Personally, I think you should get some kind of, there should be a little barrier to entry. That's my personal opinion. Yeah. Well, and there's, there's a number of different levels and ways we can do this. We could just do a very simple registration program where you just have to register and at least have some presence in Texas. So the phrase two chucks in a truck, right, who show up from, from far away when the storm hits, they can't just take your insurance proceeds and run away. So at least you have to register in advance and do something. Then there's the next level, which is more of a full regulation. You gotta pass a test, perhaps. You gotta have insurance. There's more. So that's one way of approaching it. And it's not clear yet what's going to be presented to the Texas legislature. Either it's one of those, or I will tell you what my personal view is what we need. 98% of the fraud in Texas uh, in this area involves insurance proceeds. Right? It's contractors who come in and they prey on uh, victims after disasters and they take their insurance but checks it's all, But money. it's also an education problem. There's guys running around here, thousands of them, that have no idea what state statutes are in UP laws. They don't read that stuff. Yeah. They don't understand what a deductible is. And they're out there dealing with Mrs. Smith. And you could perceive that person, because they're not taught, trained, educated on, on the insurance claim process, as doing something fraudulent when in fact they just don't know. And, right. and you, you do have a portion out there that also might be doing it intentionally. I talked, I talked to a lot of guys, you know, they put the deductible assistance sign up in their yard signs, you see it all over, you give them a call, actually my, my group calls them out. You call the owner, he's like, you know, I didn't even know I couldn't do that. Right. And so there's an education part of this thing beyond just saying, you know, everybody's doing something fraudulently. Some of the, there's just, people aren't training them. You know, I which, agree. Is, which is one of the reasons we bring some of the stuff up at Wind of Storm, the reason we're talking about this right now, it's, a, it's, it's easy to point the finger at, at a, a bunch of, a blue collar industry. I think, that, I think that's, I think there's truth in it. But we have to be a little careful and say we can't label a whole industry a blue collar and say you know, there's all this fraud when nobody's going out of their way to educate that part of the industry. It's, it's just too easy to point a finger at them. And that's, well, you know, that, but that's your job, right? That's your job. That's RCAT's job. That's North Texas Roofing's job, right? To educate with these basic principles that you can't waive deductibles, right? You can't act as a public right. adjuster. But the, the ones that are the problem are the contractors who are not trying to do the right thing. I do not want to create problems for contractors who are trying to do the right thing. But it's the ones who steal people's money. Like this guy who stole insurance checks from 111 homeowners. It's a class action that I filed on behalf of all these homeowners who had their insurance checks stolen, totaling over $500,000. Didn't do the work? He never did the work. Took no. the insurance checks and said, hey, I'm going to flip your case to a lawyer. And then he went uh, out of business. And all these homeowners who call, that, that reception is right over there. She gets called every day. She gets called from a homeowner on this list who's crying because it's been a couple of years and the roof is still leaking. No, yeah. and, this, and this same guy, possibly if he had to go through licensing, some kind of testing, that might have weeded this, this individual out. So, I mean, yeah. I'm, I think we're on the same sheet of music there. One of the guys that's on the board of directors of RCAT is probably watching us right now. Heath Hicks, if you're out there. I don't know if you know him. I just, we just spent a whole day shooting Dura last course. He mentioned something to the extent, and I don't know, you know, let me clear the air here. He said that you were actually on the other side of the RCAT's you know, trying to move for a statewide licensing. And I don't understand the schematics. And he said that you were on the other side of the camp actually once it got to session, that you were actually against it in some capacity. This drives me nuts, Anthony. The misinformation out there, which is why I like doing this, all right, I sat in meetings with the RCAP board last session and strategized on how to make this happen. I sat up for two nights all night trying to revise the bill that was submitted that RCAT didn't like to try to give it more teeth and make it more of a real bill. And I rewrote it uh, and presented it to the legislators who had pres uh, initiated the bill. I said, here's something that's better. And they looked at it. They changed it around. It's their legislation. And we presented it as a committee substitute. I am 100% aligned in working with RCAT and North Texas Roofing in addressing this issue. We have, we have complete where do you suppose the Where do you suppose the disconnect came in at that session? Uh, the disconnect came in is because for the past several sessions, we're always up there trying to make it happen, and the Tea Party Republicans don't like it. There's a couple of groups, you know, minority, small He mentioned He mentioned uh, 100, two, maybe 200 guys showed up, contractors, this oh, thing, yeah. that didn't want licensing, oh, no. and, they, and, they had a, and they had a relatively loud voice, and something to the extent that, uh, 
But you always got people that have it on a different side of the fence. But f I'm just curious what where the disconnect came because it seems like everybody's on the same sheet of music or 80 percent. Except these two small groups, the Tea Party Republicans and the small minority contractor group who brought a guy and they brought about 15 guys in the room and each of them spoke. Uh, anyway, I could go into why it didn't happen. But now, here's did you, what did you do move to side with that group? Or I did, did not. Or did, or did no, no, no. Okay. I'm a, I sat there and testified in favor of this bill, passionately. And it didn't pass. And it didn't. Well, we never even got out of session. So now we're, we're doing it right this time. We're getting organized in advance. We're working together. RCAT has, has hired people to help them make it happen. Uh, but what we have to do is this. We have to focus on consumer protection. Right. This needs to be a consumer protection bill because then we can convince both the Republicans and the Democrats who want to convince or want to help the small guy. We can say the small guy right, is getting ripped off. It's these 111 homeowners right here. Mm -hmm. right who need protection this is a consumer protection bill okay. so that's how we need to sell it to the legislature we're going to do it right this session and i will be aligned with rcat in north texas so you'd be willing to meet back with the leaders and the board of directors those folks and maybe I talk put some to them all the time okay yeah, good you bet we're on the same page on this do we have any questions on licensing out there let's shoot them out yeah let me uh let me slide this computer around and you guys can go through there's a bunch of different questions coming through imagine that huh yep. yeah some interesting people please mm -hmm. ask him why the tdi implemented the ppoc penalty that's, cool. was it? that's a whole nother issue oh we that's another back issue today and talk about insurance company issues okay hold All on right. a sec hold on a sec. i'm happy to talk about that but i don't think that's on anthony's agenda today how do we scroll down on this matt why don't you read them off yeah i can read them off too all i see is three comments <laughs> Is rigid and starter included in waste? Well, you guys want to hit me with all the insurance company issues. <laughs> <laughs> Overhead and profit. Yeah, let's talk about reasonably uh, involvement of a general contractor. I think most guys, I, look, the, at least the bigger companies on our pay, that, are, that I know in Dallas here and all, throughout Texas, most guys would like to see just a, a basic blueprint of what 30 of the other states do for licensing, which makes a lot of sense. Here's my proof of GL. Here's my proof of workers' comp. Let me take a test. We get my license, and they know that's going to have a barrier to entry. That's going to get rid of some of these chuck and a truck guys. They're probably a lot of the same guys giving away deductibles. I know from a macroeconomic standpoint, and insurance carriers aren't going to like this. It's going to drive price up, labor and material, because now you have to licensing, yep. and that's going to naturally move uh, the exact numbers up down the road. Because anytime you introduce regulation licensing, the price goes up because you have less, less, uh, less labor, less, less licensed contractors in the market, which means less supply, increased demand which means the price goes up. Now that's a good thing in the insurance restoration side because that's gonna move the exactimate numbers up which is gonna move margins up. I know that because I worked in a lot of different states as a contractor and the licensed states, northeast, some of the licensed states in the southeast and the north, just have a much higher pricing uh, regimen and exactimate, for example, insurance restoration than when you come down to states like you know, Texas or just different states that don't have licensing. Missouri is another one with no licensing. Uh, it's just a na it's a natural act of price, and I think that's a good thing. Um, it doesn't bother me at all. What the pricing is, the pricing is, right? right? And that's what we owe. Uh, we debate about you know various issues. Now your clients might not like that. No, my insurance <laughs> company clients. But they are, might like they might like that the, the that some of the fraud and right. some of the the rent and stuff going on actually gets reduced by having a basic you know licensed program. I think that's right. We'll eliminate some expense in some areas, and we'll there will be some more expense in others. But the market will will bear out as it does. And but in the end, we have a common objective here, right? It's to help the homeowners. Right? I really believe that my insurance companies do. Now I know some will say they, they they're horrible. And, they, and do they make mistakes sometimes? Sure. Uh, are there ways to punish them when they make those mistakes if they're intentional? Sure. But at the end of the day, we can't, we share an objective to make sure that Mrs. Smith gets a roof on her house. Well, at the end, of, we do the stats research every year. Insurance carriers spend billions. I know they spend billions because I do the little study mm -hmm. on it. They pinch pennies, mm -hmm. but they do spend billions. They do overall pay claims. The problem is, just get a little off the coot here, is there's, mm -hmm. there has been over the, and I've just noticed it uh, since uh, the early 2000s, there's been a fundamental change. Some people may blame it on that whole McKinsey report thing and the Allstate phenomena that happened. There, well, there was a fundamental change from 2000, 2001 to, to, to probably 2005, 2006, where pinching the pennies became systematic. To, the some, to some degree where there's a lot of missing omitted line items on the first round estimate, where it almost became a practice like, well, half the customers are never gonna do this work, so if we keep the ACV portion down lower, we're gonna save X amount, tens of millions of dollars. It makes sense. You know, that's why they don't put you know, ice and water shield codes in the, in the initial estimate, all this other stuff. They wanna wait to see if the contractor's actually doing the work. 
which has now induced a whole part of our industry that's doing supplementing, which insurance companies probably don't like, but it's almost, you almost have to, to get the permit, to get the cost of the permit, the, the, the codes, the ice and water shield, you have to send all that documentation in, which has now uh, introduced a whole, a whole uh, industry of guys that are now combing through that paperwork going, well, they don't just miss the code, they miss the starter ridge, over end profit, you know, we go on Dale about that, but there has been a change uh, systematically across carriers that are doing it, and I think that's where the pinch and the angst and some of these guys, they spent a lot of time administratively trying to get that price where they needed to be because of those missing items. It's, it's a lot of work, and that's, and that's where a lot of that stuff's going on. It'd be nice, to, be nice someday to come up with a happy medium. No, it's someone is, uh, I've gotten several suggestions from contractors. Why couldn't we just agree upon a standard residential spec? All right, let's work together to come up with a spec that says this is what needs to be done on the standard residential roof. Do you know what the, uh, big, you know what the together. biggest complaint is, and I, and I was there, is this practice, and it, and it goes back to overhead and profit, but this practice of a, a desk adjuster or an adjuster or anybody just making an assumption that they know what's complex and what's not complex by a contractor. Because at the end of the day, they're like, well, you're, you're a roofer or you're this or you're a GC, but you normally do roofing, siding, gutters. It still takes, it doesn't matter if, it's, if I'm replacing five window screens and 30 linear feet or gutters. It's a phone call, it's an invoice, it's a liability or warranty that the customer's gonna come back to you for. It's a writing of the check, and you're, uh, you know a lot about general liability policies, correct? If I write a check to a sub as a GC, this gets into the math, I'm getting an audit at the end of the year for my GL premium. So let's say I, let's say I got, a, let's say I got a, a bid at the beginning of the year for my GL insurance. I say, yeah, we're gonna do a million in sales, we're probably gonna have 300,000 sub subcontractor payroll. I'm gonna, pay a pre I'm gonna pay a premium for my GL insurance. Now at the end of the year, a storm hits or whatnot, maybe I triple, I do three million, and my subcontractor payroll is a million. Usually, most GL policies are rated as a percentage of subcontractor payroll to some degree. They're off the top or, or whatnot. Mine used to be like 4%, I think on subcontract payroll. So at the end of the year, I'm writing an a big, much bigger check on my, on my audit, on my premium. So when you get down to, you know, you, people are talking about complexity and are you supervising a job, is it complex enough? If I write a check to a guy to go replace five window screens, I'm incurring a 4% GL launch, which is by the way, going, going to the insurance company. <laughs> if, I write a check, if I write a check to a labor crew, that's gonna be rate on paying insurance. So even if it's not complicated in the, in the eyes of the desk adjuster, the carrier, I, by virtue, I'm, I'm sending 4% back to them, and I'm incurring overhead. And so this whole thought process that, well, it's not complicated enough, I think one of the biggest issues, and I, I know overhead and profit, uh, you can talk about it until sundown. We could. Is it, anytime you're doing multiple trades, it's requiring coordination to some extent. You know, you are, you're, you're invoicing somebody, you're, you're warranting something, you're calling somebody, you're scheduling a crew out there, you're inducing liability. It's, it's, there's, oh, there's overhead in all those tasks, you know, regardless of who's sitting at that desk thinks it. So I think, if we ever came to a happy medium down there, like what you talked about, one of those things would, would probably be, look, this is, the, this is our stance on overhead and profit, and this is the way it should be, instead of allowing all these individuals to, to make their minds up, because this is where a lot of the flags come in, because that overhead and profit could turn a lot of these claims a lot faster if, 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 they, if they paid it. But Anthony, you're a real general contractor. Okay, you're a real bricks and mortar general contractor. You buy not always, GL insurance. Not always. All right, but in, in, but in, in the scenario you're talking about, right? You are a real general contractor and you incur expense. What we see though and what has led to this great OMP debate is that a lot of what we see the people asking for OMP are either uh, the roofing contractor who's just doing the job as a roofing contractor or a phrase that I've coined, a paper contractor. Well, you took that from me. Yeah. Well, I uh, came up with that phrase. Paper contractor? <laughs> yeah, paper contractor. I love that phrase then. Paper right? contractor. It's because... a guy who's just a salesman, yeah. and he's selling a job, he's subbing it out for as little as he can, <laughs> and trying to live off the delta, right? And if he can get the overhead and profit approved, it's a bigger delta. I get that. So we have to identify but, first whether it's a real general contractor situation. Yeah, but you also have to understand that even roofing contractors, 90% of the roofing contractors out there, that's all, let's say that's all they do, they, they're not using employees anymore to do roofs. So they're literally hiring a subcontractor, which is a 1099, which is a separate company. Whether they're a licensed contractor or not, doesn't matter. It's still a sub that you have to manage, control, supervise, and it's still a subcontractor. It is, but they've made that choice to do it that way. And well, no, I know and so, we and made no, in, some, in some states, there's, there's no roofing contractor license. Right. So let's say, I'm like, for example, in... Uh, let me take that back. In Illinois, there's a roofing license. So there's not a GC license in, in, in Illinois per se, or there, at least there wasn't 10 years ago. There's a, there's a roofing license. 
So a lot of guys might set themselves up to be a general contractor where there's not really a general contractor license, but they do more than just roofing and they carry a roofing license. Mm -hmm. But 90% of the time, that same individual, which you might call a paper contractor, is still subbing out to different labor crews and calling in materials and dropping them and subbing out the labor, not, not employee, not, not a normal control, and flexing up to really deal with storm and fast recovery to get that done. It's a massive amount of coordination. And when you add stuff like gutters and window screens and three window claddings, it's actually more coordination to go do those three window claddings if I replace all the windows on the house sometimes because you can't get anybody to do it. It's a headache to close those claims out. And that's what some of these carriers need to understand is they don't view some of those smaller ancillary trades as, in their minds, oh, it's not complex, but it is complex. And sometimes it's harder to get someone out to do that smaller trade and finish the job, which by the way is the benefit to the carrier, Absolutely. than it is to do the whole day. I'd rather do all the windows in the whole house than replace 10 window claddings on the south and west side nobody wants to come out and do for 170 bucks. So that, and so you imagine being a contractor now, right? I don't care if you call it the roofer, the GC, whomever, it's still a human being and it's a massive, assembly line like flipping pancakes, now times that by 100 jobs. And now you got 3,000 window clients they're all different colors, all different Mrs. Smith's house. It's a conundrum of coordination. So when we, it's, it, it drives us crazy in the contract side when that, that desk goes, it's not complex enough. I'm like, man, have you ever, you know, all these little trades makes it more complex. You'd rather build the whole house, yeah. you know? And so it's, it's something that I know a lot of guys watch this right or, or feel strongly about. That's probably one of the biggest issues that we, you know, eventually you should try to get some uh, some kind of even even playing field. He's on. over here pointing. At, yeah, we're getting a lot of OMP questions. <laughs> yeah, and it's not even on the agenda. <laughs> it's not even, <laughs> we're not even supposed to talk about OMP. <laughs> we always talk. Do we about have any OMP. Xactimate is coming off a lot, like how the prices have increased over the years, and you know. Well, Xactimate. Exactly. I mean, I'm sure Steve will agree with this. Xactimate is just a stab at what the fair market pricing is. It's an algorithm in a computer. There's no law that says you have to use Xactimate. Yeah, I, I was very clear with right. the storm. My preference is real bids, right? Let's get real bids and tell me in the competitive market what this roof is going to cost. Xactimate is a guess, as but you said. in a hyper in a hyper fast post storm situation, okay? Xactimate is a great tool because you ain't gonna get anybody to come out there and give all these bids. And Mrs. Smith or the property manager over here needs to get that roof replaced. Yeah. And so in a hyper in a, in a post storm environment, getting bids is futile. And most guys would want to, would want to, and I think that's why carriers is exact. I mean, it's nice to have a nice playing field as long as it's used correctly by both sides. And I know, see, look, if I use exact, mate, use exact, mate, three adjusters on exact, mate, use exact, mate. Guess what? We're all coming up with a very different yes. number. Right. Some people are very good at using and understanding, mm -hmm. you know, like RFG versus DMO, the new the new trade labor rate thing on tear offs. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's coming up in your <laughs> your yeah. conversations. Yeah. That's a big deal because that one little line item, roofers tear off roofs. It's not like I hire my mom or the milkman to come tear off the roof, which has a lower work, some kind of lower workers' comps, some kind of over hourly rate. It's the same crew like, like crew that's tearing off the roof 95% of the time that's mm -hmm. putting on the roof. And so to have a separate trade labor rate, because if you start reading through all the little workers' comp letters and the NCI letters and all that, they're saying that should be treated the same on the RFG. Now there's there's a portion of the market out there. So this is a, this is one of ten thousand things that's no, in exact I know, and I could, But there's a portion of the market out there that's starting to, inter to understand this. And like you're right, because I always thought the tear off was extremely low. I'm like, look, we're tearing off the roof, which is sometimes harder than the install, right? Especially mm -hmm. on tile. We're dumping into a dumpster. They're telling us they're not paying for the dumpster and they're not paying for for debris removal. That's all included in this tear off price, and it's like 40, 50 bucks a square. I'm like, that's not enough money if you really think about it. I wouldn't go do it for that so, much. But here's from my side. They put on you know, general supervision. When you ask Xactimate, that's, that's, you can't have overhead and profit and general supervision. Right. It's duplicative. Yep. All right. They put the toilets on there. All right. No one gets a toilet. I mean, some do, but there's not going to be a toilet there. I get pylons. I get fencing. Um, I get OSHA uh, requirements. I get harnesses. All right. Um, well, would you take that stuff off and take the, over, says, take the overhead and profit? Well, I mean, it's those are all get, issues, but I right. get a lot of things added to these where, that should not be there. And I understand, you know, okay, well, Adam, the insurance company says, no, we'll get to a number. All right, the insurance company's going to start low, I hear. Well, we, we need to fix this somehow. I right. wish we could. I don't We're know. We're do it today. Yeah. But, but generally, anyway. generally how it works, and you know this, insurance companies come out a little low. They're coming out at 10. Contractors at 20. He might be a little high. And it meets in the middle. The, the truth is always somewhere in between, and it meets at 15. And that's the art. Of, that's the game going on on pretty much every claim in America right and, now. And most and of it, them get resolved. Though, it'd don't be nice. They? If, they do. They do. They right. do. But it'd be nice if we get to that 15 faster. It would be because we both sides know exactly what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And there's some guys that don't understand the game, that are getting 
they're entering into formal build contracts at the 10, and they're finding out later on that they have really slim profit margins. And there's some guys that can probably do it for those slim profit margins, but not everybody. And there's some guys that are probably, you know, a few guys are probably making over on the high side. I was one of them. I always got my, because I wouldn't start the job until I got my supplement approved. I had a different way of doing supplements than some guys. You know, we wouldn't actually enter into major trades until we got, we wanted to get the price dropped. Yeah. And then there's, there, and then there's, you know, there's a portion out there at the 15, but I think it's, uh, it would be nice. Again, we're all, we, we say we're, you, you mentioned you're out, out here to help the, the property owner. I think most contractors are. I think most public adjusters are. There's, you know, It'd be nice if we get to that 15 faster because at the end of the day, Mrs. Smith needs to be recovered faster. And if you're sitting there and he's supplementing shenanigans out three months after a job and if she really is leaking, there and you have a problem. You got more, you got more, you got more uh, liability for the carrier. You got a contractor whose uh, property owner's pissed off. You got all these shenanigans going on. And it actually hurts the brand equity, I think, of the carrier and sometimes the contractor too. It'd be, it'd be nice to get to that. My that clients kill. want claims resolved and paid, you bet. As quickly, they want the homeowner to have their roof fixed as quickly as possible and then move on. When claims stay open for a long time, they always get bigger. Would they ever be willing to sit in this room and come up with a, a, a plan yes. to execute these claims faster? You know, that's, that's the great question. I'm right? Could we ever sit down and figure things out? Uh, this, this idea of a model spec, all right, for a res simple residential roof is something that resonates with me, and I'd love to have a dialogue with people about if I could go to carriers and say, could we agree with these guys upon some model specification for just the typical Texas roof job that what needs to be in Xactimate? You know what they're going to be they're asking around? Isn't the model spec Xactimate? Well, no, but it's not because there's 4,000 <laughs> different line <laughs> items, right? There's all these line items that either go or don't. Well, let me ask you a question. You're an attorney. You're an entrepreneur, an attorney, very successful one, right? Well, okay. Thank so you. when you're when you're putting when you're putting a proposal together for a commercial client calls in or, or a carrier, don't you want to put together? Don't you want to include all your billable hours, your faxes, your emails, your phone calls, so that you're getting the most you can out of that project? Well, I, I, to 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 a, to to a fair market price, but to an equitable project. Um, I I have an hourly rate that I charge my insurance company clients. It's a fixed rate. <laughs> okay. That's the rate. But and, but, uh, but you like to be able to choose it. that rate and make, and make sure that you're getting a fair. Absolutely. If you're going to go take on a case of litigation, you're going to hire all these attorneys down there. So I think your contractors same thing. You know he's a, he he knows he's got to hire salespeople and staff up staff up. He's got to replace a hundred roofs now instead of ten next month because a storm hit. He's got to staff up higher. Don't you think that they want to? also scale up their companies and price yeah. needs appropriately, and why wouldn't they want overhead and profit? It's not about what you spend or what, what some a desk adjuster thinks is complex. It's what do I want to be so I can service my market and, and get my price so I can become a better company to service my market. There's a whole portion of those contractors too. Overhead and profit, I mean, so when you're pricing, you sit down and Xactimate, you know, if you use Xactimate correctly, it's a nice it's a nice system. I mean, if you use it, you know, if you get the right steep charges, get the right overhead profit, get your starter and ridge, mm -hmm. which you guys should pay for, right, guys? <laughs> it's a decent job. It's not like you're making a hundred percent profit margin, like the carriers are on premiums. It's a decent job. Like you could probably get a forty or fifty percent profit margin, right? Mm -hmm. After you had your over, you know, that's not with overhead allocation. That's what it should be because these guys got to live with these customers for five years, and a lot, you know, a lot of carriers they got to take leak calls for the next two or three years. And so if you think about margin, I think a, a contractor should be at 100% margin. I mean, if the job's 10,000, you should, because all the headaches you got to deal with. That's my personal belief, but people are saying that 40 or 50% mar margin is too much for a contractor. And it's got to be that just so that they can scale, stay alive and service that warranty later on. It's a, you know, it, they're climbing on roofs, they're tearing off roofs, they're doing a lot of things, they're getting sued, they're getting this, they're getting that. And there's all these different variables going on with contractors. So all these things tie into overhead and profit, not just the nature of how, how I supervise a job. I mean, it's, it's all the above. And I you don't know? begrudge a contractor making a profit. He should. That's that's you know the entrepreneurial well, way. So. You make a bit. That's right. <laughs> I want to make a profit also. And all I ask is this. Okay, it's an insurance job. All right. Whatever the competitive bid price would be in, a, in an open competitive bid market. All right. Whatever you would bid that job to be. Whatever it would be in that market. All right. Then let's let's work towards that. You don't get more money just because it's insurance claim. And I see this, this belief that it's an insurance claim and I should get more money. But for money. the sake of closing the claims quicker, I think, I think that's why everybody's fundamentally agreed to use Xactimate because we have, a fair, we have what we believe is a fair market price. When it's used correctly, I think most contractors think it's fair. Obviously, the insurance guys like it because they use it. Right. Some of them use stability, but most of them use Xactimate. So you can't, the problem is you can't always get those competitive bids. I mean, if I have copper gutters down there in the church and, it's, and the roof's leaking, I gotta do it. I don't have time to get, there might not even be a copper gutter sub that can get out here before two or three weeks. No. And, I say and we gotta get the deal done right. so we can enter into a formal build contract, which is why we use Xactimate. I think it's, there's just, it, there's a lot of back and forth on the line items. I think everybody knows what they are. 
And you know, someday, if the if the carriers are really interested in, in, in recovering these jobs faster, really after the best interest of the property owner, they'll probably will sit down at this table and say, you know what, I do understand what you just said because if you start thinking about it, it makes sense. And these things, you know, we're going to go ahead and, and, and make a few changes here. Otherwise, the, otherwise, this is going to go on forever. It will, and you and I will be having these discussions <laughs> a long time. So at some point, maybe we'll get to that. So all, all right, right enough, next? enough over and prop. We got off the subject, guys. We did. So we're, contractor licensing, we touched on that. We want to talk about. The nasty D word in Texas, deductibles. Oh, so these have all come in in the past week, right? We will help you cover your entire deductible. No deductible. These are all from the Dallas storm. Nope. And then the infamous advertising agreement, mm -hmm. which always match the amount of the deductible, right? We'll put a sign in your yard and you'll get paid the amount of your deductible. All right. let's, let's, for the guys who watch this round, in, in Texas, the deductible problem is 10 times worse than anywhere else because you guys have the 1% to 2% deductibles. Yeah. You know, where I'm from, Minnesota, Illinois, 500, 1,000, you know, maybe 2,500. You'd never see a 1% or 2%. It's starting to change. Yeah. You guys are changing policies out there. <laughs> What's going on? But you don't Only see the reaction to what we're dealing you with. Don't, <laughs> you don't see those big <laughs> deductibles. Here you do, so it becomes more of a problem because Mrs. Smith doesn't often, often have three, four, five, or seven grand sitting around to do her $20,000 roof. So the natural tendency of the property owner, and in some cases the entrepreneur or the contractor is, how do I help get this thing done? They don't have $7,000. Then you have greed factor on top of that. I think, it, it, I think some of it's a natural tendency. I think property owners are probably um, in cahoots with contractors on some They are complicit in the issue, absolutely. And they're, and they're probably abusing contractors <laughs> against and, and playing to... Real contractors back. come, real contractors. Contractors who don't waive deductibles come to me every day. They say, we lose so many jobs because the first question the homeowner asks is, will you cover my deductible? Right? So initially, more than anything else, it's a consumer education issue. Yeah. We have to educate Texans that, damn it, you got to pay your deductible. Well, I'm sorry, but you do. We've seen heated debates on the SVG page, you guys watching us, and, and the big thing I hear pop up is, look, there's statutes about it. It's never enforced. Nobody ever wants to take it against a property okay, owner. Okay, so two issues, all right? Number one, the Texas Business and Commerce Code provision that says you cannot waive deductibles. Uh, it is not very well enforced. Uh, if at all, and there's an old attorney general opinion that these guys cite that gives them a safe harbor, uh, they believe, to waive deductibles, okay? So uh, that's the, the issue we have with the statute. Do the carriers really care? I got the feeling they don't care about it. Well, no, we do care. We absolutely care. Do they really? Yes, the, the, because the home. I, I have this weird feeling that they're like, yeah, they're fighting no, over that $10,000 claim, driving it down. Hallelujah, let them fight. No, we, you, never, you never hear of a carrier ever. I've never heard of a carrier actually going after a property owner Okay, so or, okay, right, never we, heard no, of it. well, we can't go after them. All right, it's really not necessarily our issue. All right, but here's where it is an issue, and the Texas Department of Insurance is getting hot on this issue. Okay, if let's, let's just do a simple claim: ten thousand dollar roof claim, one thousand dollar deductible. All right, contractor waives the deductible. All right, what does that mean, waive? They don't charge it. We're not going to okay. charge you. There's, there's 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 a couple different meanings of waive. Or that, or a advertising credit. Okay, right. at the end of the day, then that claim. All right, or the amount that the homeowner, uh, the total claim amount is $9,000. Right. But when they go to submit that replacement cost holdback claim to the insurance company, what do they submit? $10,000, right? So the contractor's only doesn't, charging Doesn't that make nine. it easier for the insurance company's no, accounting system? It makes it, yeah. <laughs> it makes it insurance fraud. I'm, I'm, I'm it joking. makes, I know, it makes it insurance fraud though. All right, so when that contractor waives a deductible, all right. all right, and says, I'm only gonna charge you $9,000, when he tells the insurance company that's a $10,000 job, that is a material misrepresentation in support of the insurance claim, and right. he and the homeowner have, have committed insurance fraud, and the Texas Department of Insurance is now paying attention to that issue. Okay. So that so might be enforced if it's that, tough. That, okay. I believe, will be enforced in the months ahead. And here's what else is, go what else is gonna happen, two things. If we can get contractor regulation through, all right, and licensed contractors, contractors should have a code of ethics or conduct, and one of the things they will agree to, I would hope, in the bill is that they will not waive deductibles. So instead of waiting for a district attorney to, to go after someone criminally, the, the state can yank their license. Mm -hmm. And that's a real deterrent, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, so that'll Let me be ask a question. Issue. So let's say the $10,000 job was done, and the contractor set in and said, hey, here's my certificate completion, work's complete, roof's done. Um, and, I, and I build the customer $9,000. That's okay. all the insurance company pays. Jeez, so what if there, there's a $1,000 depreciation, they're gonna lose, are they gonna lose that $1,000 they intended to pay out? No, no, the ACV is always paid first. Let's say they paid five ACV initially, right? right? That's already been paid. Then the issue is whether, the, whether they get four or five back. Right? right. Okay. If it was a ten thousand yeah, dollar job, five thousand up front. Well, right, and then they get four thousand in the back end. So four, presumably five, deductible. but then a thousand less. For, so they're going to send four. Right. Now they send an invoice for nine. They can only send three. That's right. 
Yeah, we're only going to send three. If we know that a duck will Now, I know that. Paid, now, a lot of guys watching this right now, there's, to me, there's a mathematical way around a deductible issue. If a homeowner opts to not do their window, and it, I know you don't like to hear it, but the, if the ACV portion of that window, they can do what they want with the ACV money, right? Yeah. If that window is $1,000 for the, for the window, let's say it's a resash, and the homeowner can live with the free dents, they're taking a hint perhaps later on in the value of their property, then that thousand dollar fundamentally washes out the deductible. I am absolutely fine with that. Yeah, there's, well, there's no, no problem with that. And you don't it, even you don't even need to mention the D word because the math already works. The roof's eight. The roof's let's say the roof's nine thousand. The window sash a thousand. Homeowner opts not to do the sash. The ACV portion, as right. long as you don't invoice for the sash. That's the key. That's the key. That's yeah. the key. As long yeah. as they don't then tell us that they replaced the window, right. we're on the same page. Right. As long as it's just the portion then of the window ACV, yeah. and then they write a check to the contractor. For the thousand dollars, then if that's what the window is uh, equaled, I'm perfectly then fine. Then, with then that. there's no deductible collect. That's right, yeah. and they so just live with a dented window. They live with a dented and there's window. There's no insurance fraud. But if they tell us they replaced the window, right. and Anthony, that's what we see. Yeah. I mean, I've got clients out there, insurance companies who go out now and they're doing it reinspects on all the jobs, uh, and they're sending bills to contractors for all the work that wasn't done. Let me let me throw something out there. That I know you, that's interesting. You should think about, but there is no tra just so you know there is no training for a contractor of how to send, there is in my program, but how to send a certificate of completion to the carrier. What variables do you use? What's depreciation? So while you guys expect the average, I'm talking about the average contractor, that maybe they never dealt with a claim before. The average contractor, like Hurricane Sandy, those guys don't deal with claims often. You get hit with all this, they all are doing all these things. The average contractor who's been through 10 or 15, 20 insurance claims, doesn't even know what a certificate of completion is. And a lot of them don't even know what ACV depreciation is. So you have, a, you, again, I'm going to go back to this. There's an education part. It's easy to say you expect all contractors to know this stuff. There's probably a lot of contractors, especially right here in Texas, you know, that maybe uh, just don't understand it. Now, there's probably some that systematically abuse it. But it's not like you guys are offering a training program. Hey, you're dealing with state farm claims. Here's how you release depreciation. Come on in. I got my contractor training program. There ain't nobody doing that. And so for, you to, for everyone to expect the contractor to have an engineering degree, a law degree, a contractor degree, a license, and be this perfect entrepreneur, somebody has to provide a little training in those administrative areas because I think there's a portion of the market out there that doesn't. There's a lot of guys that call us like, hey, I don't understand this depreciation ACV. They might just send it in, match, you know, in some cases match up the RSV because they don't know any better. And then there's other guys that do it systematically. So I'm just saying there's an education, there's a vacuum there that needs to be filled beyond just pointing a finger at the whole industry. Everybody's doing wrong. Who's educating them? Where's the school? Where's the training? So this kind of bleeds into the third topic, doesn't it? Authorized practice of public adjusting. Right? <laughs> I mean, some would say, right, that they shouldn't be doing any of that stuff, right? Their contractors are not insurance. Well, how do you build? People. Well, you have to get paid. Well, Keep. because the the, the, you know, the contract is between the insurance company and the building owner. Then there's a contract between the roofer and the building right. owner. Some would say those two shall never cross, right? Now, I believe and I recognize and I commit to this that there is a gray area in the middle. Mm -hmm. And this is what I teach my insurance company adjusters, all right? Be nice. Work cooperatively with the contractor who's trying to do the right thing for Mrs. Smith, all right? Be nice when you're dealing with that contractor. Help them through the process. Talk about the estimate. Talk about these issues. Be cooperative. Do you want to know, know the truth that's happening? You want to know the truth in the streets? I know what's happening. I no, know and I hear the this. The truth, 90% of desk adjusters and field adjusters love dealing with the contractor. Not love, but would rather deal with the contractor than you or a public adjuster yes. in a claim. Because, because we're not that trained in all the little variables. And, but that and we send our thing and we do what we're told. A lot of them just do what we're told. Okay, they release their money. And they would never pick up the phone and go, most of them don't. Hey, you're violating UPA laws. You shouldn't send it in. They just want to close that claim out. They're like anybody else. they got a stack of... Is that your experience? Absolutely. Okay, 100%. good. I want people in Texas who are complaining. They say that, oh, no, the industry's gone bad. Badger's oh, gone bad. I'm not bad. saying, don't give them, I'm not saying they give them a bad time. They, give them a bad, they do give them a bad time sometimes. I'm saying 90% of those desk adjusters, they got files on their desk, too. Yeah. they got to close it out. Yes. They, they, you know, those little gutters got to be done, everything else. And so when that contractor's calling in about price or releasing money, I'm just telling you the truth is, most of those guys aren't going, hey, you're violating UPPA or all that. They just want to close the damn thing out. They want to go home at five o'clock, just like anybody else. That works, Anthony, okay, but the and ones it has that don't to. work, right, are the ones who are actually saying, I have insurance claim specialists, Let me see. right, <laughs> uh, on staff, all right? I'm the contractor, I'm gonna act as a that on my, I used to have that on my card yeah, too in 1999. You can't do that anymore. I'm gonna act as a representative in matters, and I'm gonna discuss the claim and handle it for you, all right? Um, or, you know, this one as well. I will file the claim, uh, and I have confidence that we will win, all right? 
These are the ones <laughs> that we're trying to address. Right. Like this guy, right, who posted on Facebook after that he's gunning for me and he's going to pissing straight benzene and give me a blindfold. I'm going after Badger. Whoa. You know, like the voicemail I left you the other day, all right, uh, I, I forwarded to you where all the right. contractor told uh, my client, this shit ends now. All right, those are the ones that are creating a problem that we are fighting. Is that why I had to go against. through all that security when I came up? That's <laughs> right. We were a little nervous. So yeah, this is real well, stuff. Well, this yeah, that that's. But just so you know, in 1999, this is the way people operate. There was no UPPA laws. But know? then what came after 1999? Storm Ventures Group, lots of yeah. entrepreneurs who are in the business, and a lot of guys who do it right, but guys who don't do it right. But but this is an edu This is off. This is an education too. You could call this guy, and he may very well. Started his business last week or last year. Sure, he might know nothing about UPA laws or statutes. It's not like these guys don't have law degrees. They're not. They're not necessarily glued to reading state statutes. This could simply be an education issue where he just doesn't. You know, maybe he borrowed it from his last boss. Yeah. A lot of this stuff, this literature and these contingency agreements, get handed down from company to company. Which is why you guys should buy our stuff because we we update it so you don't violate the laws to the best of our ability. We we went through an evolution too where all of our some of our agreements we use even after just two years talking to you guys a year ago. Yep. Changing all the language so you don't have that language in it. I think the whole industry is going through that though. So some of this you got to take as, a, as, as an industry evolution that's going on. And I've had contractors call me after I've reached out to them with a letter saying you can't do this. They'd say, "Hey Badger, thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry. They probably what appreciate do I the do? warning. I refer them to a lawyer who helps them change their contracts and they change now, do you, their practice. Would you, are you gonna, would you find those guys or would you just give them a scare? Or what, well, gonna, I, my typical practice is this: if it looks like someone who just truly doesn't know what they're doing, like I'll that, either like call that, them like or send guy. them a nice letter. <laughs> yeah. But when they're a crook, you know, they're, they're actually threatening to, you know. I'm going to sue you and all this stuff, yeah. then I will turn them into the TDI. Yeah, and the TDI is now issuing orders, uh, cease and desist orders, and fining these contractors who are doing this. Okay. Um, I agree with all that stuff, and I think most of the guys like on the SVG page, they are now evolving their contracts and taking the own insurance claim specialists off. I get it. Yeah, we get it. Um, I think that's an evolution that needs to continue to happen through education. I think where some of that goes, though, and it cross over into the area of, you know, there's guys that ask questions on our page, you know, can I pick up the phone and, and discuss my price? There's this, there's still a connotation out there that guys can't openly well, express free speech and, and discuss their price as an entrepreneur with anybody that's in their three foot peripheral on the, the phone. Texas bulletins and the Texas statutes say they can discuss their price. Right. Now, I would recommend they do it with, the, with their client the homeowner present. Well, sure. Just makes it cleaner. Yeah, All sure, right. Have the client, have the homeowner be there. Talk about the estimate. Talk about getting to Mrs. Smith's number right. to get the roof replaced. Because in Florida, they have some very strict UP laws too. They oh, say, look, new laws you cannot act tough. as a public adjuster. But there's another statute below it says, however, if you're the signed contractor that is beginning repairs. All that goes away. You can pick up the phone now and talk to the insurance company about your price, what you're finding, your code, because you've got so many codes there. So you have to read both statutes. And some people, some people read the one, well, read <laughs> and, they don't read, and they don't That's read the other one. That's an interesting issue in Florida They don't now. read the other one. If, if I'm a contractor taking an AOB, I'm going to look at that, but I'm going to read the other statute that says I cannot negotiate the claim and act as a PA, and that new law that just became effective may trump the old AOB stuff. I know right. that's a hot topic in well, Florida. Well, throw it, toss the AOB, because some guys don't even know it. Some guys don't even like AOBs. You know, now you're, you're, you're getting, you're, to present an AOB sometimes to a customer is not easy to do at a kitchen table. You're going to sign the rights to your claim over it. You just knock the door. I mean, sometimes right. the AOB is not appropriate. I've talked to guys. Sometimes it is on long, long cycle commercial jobs where you're invested in infrared, doing all this stuff. You want to make sure you get paid. But right. at the end of the day, they're just trying to get paid. Yep. But but take the AOB out of it. The, the average contractor who doesn't know anything about insurance restoration, let's say Florida, you just go start ripping off that roof. You got all kinds of code issues in Florida. I own a home in Florida. It's roof is in production right now. That contractor has to freely be able to pick up that phone and talk about safety, code, price, and anything he dang well pleases to that insurance company because he's doing a job. He's, he's actually held liable for a lot of those things, and, and he can. But there are people out there that are portraying that first statute as if, you know, they don't, because these guys don't read statutes, as if, well, do I need to hire a public adjuster to talk about my price? No, you don't. Not once you begin to work. You're the entrepreneur. It'd be like it'd be like someone telling you, you couldn't discuss your price with whoever you're, whoever you're billing. The AOBs it doesn't, it doesn't give make the sense. right to do that. It's hugely controversial. I don't have to deal with that in Texas because they're not allowed here. Right. So. But they can pick up the phone here and discuss their price. Um, my advice to my insurance company clients is to be nice. Right. If the contractor but, is, being but there is nice, no statute that says they cannot do that here. Oh sure, there we have a uh, we have unauthorized practice of public adjusting 
But um, discussing your that's that's the gray area that you guys got to be careful well, so of. Discussing your price as the entrepreneur is not being acting as a public yeah. adjuster because a public adjuster is not a licensed contractor. The Texas bulletins that came out interpreting our public adjuster licensing statute have said that a contractor can discuss his estimate. Can. Yes, Thank can God. discuss Thank his you. estimate. But as soon as you start saying, if you don't pay this, I'm calling my PA friend or I'm suing you for bad faith, all right, that crosses the line. Well, it right? that creates a little war. But yeah, but we got to be careful, you know. Look, I served in the military. I'm all about the Constitution, the United States, and all that. We got to be careful that we don't ever tell an American entrepreneur, or American citizen, that he can't dictate his or discuss his own price in a free market economy, which is what we're based on, because now we're talking about socialism, communism, all the other stuff. We're not, no, you, you, we should not be living in a, first of all, you get real philosophical, we shouldn't be living in a price fix system, technically an Xactimate, where everybody's on this, hey, this is the price. Because that's not how a free market economy works. That's based on the laws of supply and demand. I got an MBA in, in economics and marketing, so I know that. But also just the basic premise that an entrepreneur should be able to discuss uh, negotiate his own price. That is not acting as a public adjuster. That's for the vague area. Some people that don't understand basic business. Negotiate his own price. Negotiate his price as the one doing the job. That's yeah. his, that's well, he should be negotiating that with the person he has a contract with, which is well, that's the not, homeowner. Yeah, but the insurance company's paying the bill. Well, so that's when we get to the gray. So the, the only gray area I see is a contractor shouldn't be discussing and interpreting policy coverage. Okay, yeah. I get it. That's that's what a public adjuster is trained to. We're acting as an attorney. Yeah, but, we but when you're that. talking about our world, we're the ones doing the work. We're tearing off the roof. We know the codes. We know the OSHA violations. We know what it costs to pay that guy. That's our price. Okay, so let's. There, there's a school of thought that says you guys shouldn't even have the the. You guys don't have the education or license or experience to discuss our price with us. Why should you? Why should a desk adjuster? Why should even a public adjuster who's maybe has never done a roofing project before? You know, they read about exact and stuff. Why do they have some kind of great degree or license that they can even discuss my price with me as a contractor? Maybe they should get a contractor license and they should get a contractor violation for negotiating with me on my price because I'm after safety, productivity, p and I want to make money on the job, I know what my overhead is. Who's to say that anybody has, has more authority or experience than me to discuss my own price with me? Well, that all goes to you and your insurance. Right? Insurer. Well, think but about I it. I have it with, there's a contract between my client and the homeowner and the I insurance know. company. And, and that's the I, And, I, and I, I, I agree. Look, we, we have a lot of public adjusters that come to our, our, our forum and our network. I want them to have that business. I, we don't want to attack their business. I just think that the vague term negotiated claim is being misused to make people think suddenly you can't act as an American citizen or entrepreneur. So, and that's what we have to be careful of because that violates the Constitution. Remember, pure pricing, right? Just the pricing issue, talking about your estimate. But then we have the, the more common issue is whether the roof is damaged. All right, so the contractor's up there saying, that's hail damage. All right, is that a coverage question? It is a coverage no, question. No, not isn't necessarily. It? Roofing stuff, I mean, a, a roofer should be the expert if the granules are, are worn out due to weather, workmanship, or warranty. Would not the roofer be the expert over the engineer, the public adjuster, an attorney, or a desk adjuster? Technically, uh, they work with those materials every day. They should be able to say openly with their opinion whether or not. They believe the damage is due to this without being uh, in fear of a fine or jail or well, something that like that. That leads into the coverage question. Now, now coverage, I agree. Physical, no, coverage, I agree. What's physical loss or damage? You should pay for this. That's in your policy. <laughs> yeah, we get that. But, hey, I think there's, this is hail damage. Look, Can't I'm going to go back and let's, we'll wrap this part of it up. <laughs> be nice, okay? I tell everyone on my side, be nice. If we're trying to work together to help Mrs. Smith, be nice, all right? Yeah. The only contractors that we are going after are the ones who are not being nice. All right, when they start threatening to sue my company and yell at them and let them berate them in voicemail messages, I'm going after them, all right? All I want to do is make sure that people don't rip off my clients. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what a great, because we could talk, we could, we'll, we'll probably debate this every year. You're coming back to win a storm, aren't you? I'd love to, thank I heard you. you. I heard you're going to host a couple breakout sessions this year. Uh, that, if that's what you'd like me to do, I'd love They'd to. We can just have feedback. a discussion like this. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right, a couple questions. Do we have time for that yeah. real quick? A lot of people really appreciated that you had the guts to come out to uh, win the storm. There's a few people saying that. So. Nice, thank you. Um, hey, what about me? I showed I could have got I could have got a subpoena today myself walking in. That's right. Thank you for coming here. I watched some of my attorneys over there checking you out uh, that's, uh, during this today. So yeah, uh, some people are, are wondering why the insurance companies don't back the contractors up when it comes to paying the deductible, like telling the insured, hey, like it's your responsibility to pay the deductibles. They should. The insurance company should stand behind the contractor uh, and enforce the insured to pay their deductibles. Uh, and one of the things we're hoping 
that we could address is an issue that if we could ensure somehow legislatively that deductibles are paid, uh, and we're looking into that issue. Pavlov dog theory, as soon as they put one customer in handcuffs yes. for playing a, the, the, uh, the deductible game, guess what? Everybody will pay their deductible. We Somebody's got to, it's all, it's all about enforcement. Somebody's got to enforce it either so, on, on, on both sides. I know you were saying, obviously, we're all trying to be nice here. So someone said being nice doesn't necessarily prevent the insurance company from going after you for UPPA. Uh, it does not. But I think most of the insurance companies, when I get a report of UPPA, if I look at it, um, I say, look, this is fine. A lot of the time, I've got no problem with it. For example, I got one the other day, and the homeowner forwarded an email from the contractor. The contractor laid everything out that was wrong in the estimate, sent it to the homeowner, and the homeowner forwarded it to the insurance company. And the adjuster sent it to me and said, Badger, isn't this wrong? I said, no, because you got it from the homeowner, right? The homeowner sent it to you. You're not dealing with the contractor. So if you want to be nice, lay out your argument and your position in an email to the homeowner and have the homeowner forward it. All right, and then have the homeowner say, let's meet next Tuesday at my house, and the three of us, let's sit down and figure this out. All right, that's what we need to do. What else we got? Um, so one year deductible, what about MRP, where the carrier waves a deductible? So, booyah. Booyah, yeah, so here's my that's view on that. Um, we are not waiving the deductible in that situation. All right, this is a contract. That's, un that's unfair business practice, though. So. No, no, because it's not. We have a contract with the homeowner that sets forth their interest that they're going to pay, their deductible. If we choose not to enforce that but is it, our but, contract. But just, okay, take the legal mumbo jumbo out. There's no Ethically and just philosophically, if an insurance company can send in a contract and say, hey, use this guy, it's okay not to pay your deductible, it's very hard for you to hold other contracts accountable in the marketplace and say, well, we can do it, but you can't do it. It just doesn't make sense. Well, but it's, it's our contract. Again, you have your contract with your insurer, with your client. I have a but contract. But then you just ruin the value and the notion of why the deductible is so important by saying it's okay for our contract to do it, but not the other 80% of the marketplace. I understand the argument. It's, it, it, yeah, it's hard to, it's, again, it's hard in, to enforce in, something if you don't do it yourself. In a managed repair situation, and I know, you know that a lot of companies are going to that, um, and uh, the company is saying, look, we will not enforce the deductible. I think it's different than waiving it, and the statute that makes it illegal right, addresses third-party conduct, not insurance. It's going to be conduct. very difficult to come up with enforcement and saying you can put this contractor in jail or fine him for waiving or not collecting a deductible and yet have a second group of contractors under a wing of a huge carrier that they don't have to charge deductibles because you create an unfair business practice it's monopolistic. Should I say the word monopolistic? Monopolistic. <laughs> right. But I it think what you'll find, construed. Anthony, what you'll find in those policies is the policy says we have a managed repair program, and in the situation where you go into the managed repair program, the deductible will not apply. So but, you're, it's not being waived. It just doesn't apply in that situation. But it, but it ruins the premise that the deductible is such this big deal to 80% of the marketplace. It ruins the ability to force it legally because that could be challenged all day long then because of an unfair business practice. Probably probably not going to be solved today. Nope. But it's a sore point with a lot of guys. I hear that a lot. Because it because it makes you guys it makes the carriers and this whole notion that deductible is such this ethical thing when you can have a have another set of rules for another set of contractors of which that are driving down uh, market pricing in many cases um, for a lot of the guys out there. I hear the argument. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, uh, there's, uh, so obviously when you spoke about the supplementing, talk to the insured. Um, so you want the insured to fight for their own supplements. Then when the insurance says no, they turn against the insured against the contractor and then the contractor is screwed. This, uh. this is the, and that's, that's part of the thing. See, I don't, I don't think it's the homeowners, personally, and it's, I've been on a lot of kitchen tables. I think the contractor should be talking directly to the carrier because they're doing the work. And a lot of times, Mrs. Smith doesn't want to be in that position, and she does chooses not to be. They don't want to sit and decipher and go back and forth. A lot of times, they don't have time. Sometimes they're out of state and they're dealing the rental property. It just doesn't make, in a real post-storm environment, that stuff just doesn't make sense, and it really doesn't happen. You're picking up the phone. You're dealing with it. There's a little bit of this going on. You're starting at 10, you go to 20, you're going to 15, and that's what happens 98% of the time. Most people aren't writing up a synopsis for their property owner and going back because it don't, nobody has time anymore. So here's Everybody's I, running out of time. So supplementing is a hot topic right now. Here's what I tell my, my clients what I recommend to them. If you get a call from the contractor who put on the roof, emphasis on those words, from the contractor who put on the roof, and he says, hey, you know, these additional items, and when you look at my revised estimate, and I got this supplement of, of stuff that I really did, mm -hmm. all right, talk to them. 
Be nice, okay? Talk about what their about estimate What about if they, they got materials in a driveway? They're formally contracted, they got a deposit in a bank, they're about to start the job and they already know they're gonna have these 500 issues that weren't addressed. Sure. And they have to address them it's for code, for safety, for everything else. Whenever it is during the process, right? You're discussing their estimate. I understand there's a gray area. The PAs don't like it when I say there's a gray area and it's okay. But here's the problem we're having. When I emphasize the contractor who did the job, now there's these supplementing companies out there <laughs> who are not the contractors. And my clients are getting calls from supplementing companies who they say, hey, we're gonna get you six more grand and they're gonna take a third of it, all right? And they're doing that. And what I tell my clients when that third party supplementing company, not the contractor who did the job, but a third party supplementing company calls, hang up on them, all right? You got no obligation to talk to these people. All right, and so that now that's, a, that's an inter that's an me. interesting phenomenon because the way the statutes written, the UPPA laws are addressed to the contractor. Well, so I would argue. So that a the third party supplementer actually can't violate UPPA laws. Is that correct? Because, no, what he could do. He's not acting as a contractor. He's a third party. Well, he's a lawyer. Then he's act He's doing the unauthorized <laughs> practice of law. All right, he's acting on behalf of someone. That's even worse. not necessarily. He's not portraying himself to be an attorney. I'm well, saying, but, but he's, if he's negotiating, then the claim. Well, does this happens in the medical in the medical side of this happens all? I mean, there's so all. So who's he acting on behalf of though? The supplementing company who calls my client. Who's he acting on behalf of? He's acting on behalf of the contractor, right? Which is two steps removed from my customer. Then, right? So then you have to file. You have to file another state statute that <laughs> prohibits the third, that the third party. Yeah. I, look, it's, <laughs> you Wouldn't it be? Hey, look. Topic. At the end of the day, we we had some good conversation here, guys. Yep. We probably got a billion questions, but I got, we got a room full of two hundred. We got to get to. Yep. At the end of the day, wouldn't it be can do? Wouldn't it be beneficial to the industry to get five or six insurance execs in here? A couple policyholder attorneys, maybe a couple public adjusters, a couple leading contractors, and have a half a day powwow and say, look, here's the issues. At the end of the day, everybody says they want Mrs. Smith to recover faster, correct? Yeah. Everybody says that. I hear the policyholder attorneys, public adjusters, you just said it earlier, contractors. I know contractors because that's how they get paid. Wouldn't it be interesting or wouldn't it be beneficial to the industry to have a powwow for half a day and come up with maybe just 10 things that we could set some kind of bar or protocol on, and maybe that doesn't become set in stone? But people would start understanding each other a little bit better. I am all about and that. And that which would lead yes. to faster recovery. Because yes. wouldn't it be nice to know you have a certain group of contractors out there that followed a basic blue per expender protocol? Not just your MRP companies, because let's be honest, they're never going to get more than 2%, you know, two, three percent market share anyways, because our guys are going to be out there beating them to the punch. All right? Yeah. So wouldn't it be nice to have a little protocol and discussion that maybe sped all this up and save the insurance carriers money, brand equity, people banging on their names, contractors' time, cash flow problems? and maybe just alleviate a 10 or 20% yes. of the problems. Yes, so all of you Texas contractors out there, all right, watching this, if you're a member of RCAT or North Texas Roofing, call your board members and ask them how many emails I have sent to their leadership and their, their legislative advisors about getting together and meeting and talking about all these issues. I'm talking nationwide. Going, well, I can only fix so many problems, right? But nationwide, I get but it. But you're right? in touch with some of the biggest carriers. I am. And we could start here. You know, we've had a productive dialogue get them with in a room. Get them in a room. Would, yes. they, would, they come in a, would they come and sit down? For, if, they're yeah. really if they're really after the property's best interest, would they sit in a room for a half a day and understand some of the basic real philosophy uh, discussions going on. And I would advocate that happens because well, dialogue let's is Let's set good. it up. All right, we'll make it happen. Thanks. Man. All right, guys. See you All soon. Right.